Awesome. Well, I get the privilege today of sitting down with Isaac Adams and Austin from United We Pray. They joined us this weekend for uh, Let's Talk About Race Seminar. And many of you came to that, and I'm glad you did. And I hope that the Lord used it to stir up some good conversation. But hey, thanks for joining us, guys. James, thanks for joining us, our Next Gen Director. Um, it was a great conference. Yeah. I, I mean, it's so many like angles to look at and understanding mm. and the way that you and Jack both brought like this just deep gospel centered love of Christ mm. and love of the church is refreshing to be part of and mm. to learn from. And so it was so fun to, to be there a little information overwhelm, but, <laughs> but so fun. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm glad we get to process. I mean, that's what we get to do, but no, thank y'all for having us. It was, it was really fun to be here with you. Have you ever heard a 16 point message before? I was going to say there's like 23 points, right? The last 26. thing. Oh, the I, first one was 11. The last one was, it was really 13. It was, right. it was, a, you know, you know, but, we but you made your point. Like pray right. some more. Pray some more. Pray about it. That's actually, I'd love to ask that question. So when you, you we're not the first church you've talked to yep. and, and probably encouraged in that way. Do you find that Christians receive that wisdom well? Like praying, like the 13 of your 26 points were pray? Yeah. Or is it like, all right, Isaac, I get you because you're a pastor. Of course, we're supposed to pray. Yeah. Like, do you find that people believe you on that? That's so funny you ask that. Like, because... Uh, I do find they believe me. And I, what I honestly find uh, and what we found when we travel is that folks are two things. They're one convicted <laughs> because, and I think you, I mean, prayer is the one area like that we always feel we could be doing more, should be doing more. <laughs> uh, and if you want a Christian to be convicted, just ask them about their prayer life. Right. Uh, so convicted and two, uh, and I'll throw in a third thing. I, some folks just act like it's, it's rocket science. Like, man, we haven't, we've been doing all this stuff, whatever it is, you know, reading these books and all these things. And I think that's great. I write books. I hope people read them. Mm -hmm. Um, but we haven't thought to pray about it, <laughs> like just pray about it. And then three, I hope that people then are relieved mm -hmm. that are like, I think a lot of, I think, you know, in the current kind of conversation about race, there's so many voices to listen to. There's so much condemnation to feel or to make other people feel that to say, Hey, here's one thing, you know, uh, the yoke is easy. The burden is light. Here's one thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's simple and you can do it and it's just hard to keep doing. So I'd say convicted, surprised and relieved are some combination of our reception. Awesome. Hmm. What would you add to that? If you go to our website, you will see, um, aims that we mean to be about as a ministry, like is wherever we go, whatever we're doing, whether we're writing, speaking, podcasting, whatever, this is how we're trying to behave. And, um, in that Isaac talks about how just, uh, when you're dealing with a controversial topic, it helps to have a non-controversial approach mm -hmm. and something Christians all agree about is the importance of prayer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. so let's start there yeah. where everybody in the room, if you're a believer, you agree. And that that's just made it really accessible, and I think does all the things Isaac says. Mm -hmm. Praise God! Yeah, like the spirit behind it is prayer permeates the whole thing. It's yeah. the preparation, it's the midpoint, it's the afterwards. Yes, it, you, you never stop praying about whatever issue you're facing. Yeah. But prayer permeates the whole thing. Well, and I, I mean, like from my frankly, from my ex even experience of the conference. I felt that the room changed when we started praying. Mm, yeah. I wish, you know, in some sense, like I, you know, yeah, we joke like a lot of points, a lot of like all of that, you can get lost in it. Um, there's part of me that just wants to throw all that out and be like, let's <laughs> pray. I mean, that is the work, like, mm. uh, that what we're trying to do. And I think so often as Christians, we treat prayer as a last resort. Uh, or all I can do about it is pray. And it's like, man, in some sense, the most you can do about it is pray. And so we often, you know, we say, if we want to be faithful in this area, we have to do more than pray, but we cannot do less. And what we're, what we're trying to do with prayer is, is say, start here. You know, yeah. so many of us, uh, we're just, we just are looking for a place to start. And it's really hard to keep praying about the same thing for a long time. Mm. So we found that prayer keeps us more than busy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And... Uh, yeah, hopefully permeates the thing. I like that word, mm. permeate. Can you give us, you shared some of this already today. Yeah. People, let me feel read your book, but can you give us like a synopsis of what, 
was there like a catalytic event in your life or a mm. season where the Lord put on your heart to help the church in this way, to, mm. write, to write a book and to travel and to help yeah. churches? Oh, I love that phrase, catalytic event. That's awesome. <laughs> That's just, I mean, because all of us, when we're... When we change and when we grow, especially on this issue, so, it, typically there's some event or some something that happens. For me, by God's grace, it was um, it was 2017, and still, I mean, honestly, in the wake of if there's been lots of let's just call them racial tragedies over let's just call it even the last 10 years, like Trave, 10, 11 years, Trayvon in 2012. Michael Brown in 2014, George Floyd in 2020. Now there can be lots of opinions about all that, but like those three things happened. And I think those three, just in my estimation, were kind of epicenters in which Christian churches across America felt the shock waves and tremors of. Okay. So it's 2017, but I think, you know, it's 2016. Uh, and we're f we're still kind of in the wake of Michael Brown, and there's just so much division. So much strife. And um, by God's grace, somehow I stumble. So, uh, you know, everyone's tweeting. I'm tweeting. We're all not helping each other. Uh, and so uh, I had picked up this this copy of sermons by a pastor named Francis Grimke, uh, African-American, uh, late uh, 19th century pastor from Washington, D.C. And he had a sermon called God and Prayer as Factors in the Struggle. And I was a Christian when I read it, but I kind of joke, I feel like I got saved again. Like, I was just <laughs> like, man, like, man, like, I was on the power of prayer. And so what I tried to do was plant a flag in the ground, kind of like what Austin was saying to say, like, okay, God commands prayer. Church history commends prayer. You have Grimke's examples. And he was just, he was talking about the prayer life of the slaves, like, man, I'm not even enslaved. Like, and the, they were just praying. He's like, mm. prayer is all the only weapon they had and how mightily did they wield it. Mm. And he's like, day after day, they poured their prayers into the ear of heaven. And I was like, yeah, I'm just not even praying about this. And so uh, I was like, maybe we can try to model some helpful conversations and maybe not even just talk to each other. We can talk to God and actually pray on the show. So we try, we just that's what we do when we travel and when we speak and when we podcast. So, um, and by then, you know, since the, it's funny, I, I, I kind of say like our stuff isn't super cool. It's not super innovative. Austin, I think has a helpful phrase. Maybe you can wax on. It's like, we have nothing new as a ministry. Um, no new ideas, no new ideas, no new ideas, but, uh, Churches seem to be helped by it because it's what God's people do. We rely upon God in prayer. I mean, uh, Shai was talking about Esther, and what did she tell the people? Did y'all need to pray and fast mm. for me? Like that's it, and uh, watch God do the rest. So, um, yeah, tw I would say somewhere in 2016, 2017, when things got got going, and uh, we're still praying. So, talking about how it impacts, you know, the seminar. Yeah. And and your line that you used is like you you feel the unity that happens in, in prayer, yeah. And you could feel that very much in the room. Yeah. And it was y'all's people praying, mm -hmm. like it wasn't me. Like it was, I love when people are just standing up and praying. And yeah, anyway, yeah, it's, it's it's awesome to to uh, on an issue that there are so many thoughts and so such either hesitation to misstep, yeah. um, or uh, oblivious to overstep, yeah. Um, to be enough to start with like, Hey, here's what we're unified in. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and the kingdom of God uh, further infiltrating our hearts and minds and life. Yeah. So yeah. man, you feel that in prayer. It's all, it's fantastic. Bless mm. the Lord. Bless the Lord. I'm curious just from today and your conversations with people or questions, Austin, that were submitted. I know we got through a few of those. Um, Anything helpful for us as a church to be thinking through, like things that you heard, maybe it's an encouragement, but also like an area of growth you could see us hmm. moving towards. You don't have to give names, obviously, but like, what did you learn about well, us? Well, so and so <laughs> did say to me, Adam, I've only been here a few hours, but like this. <laughs> Yeah, just so you know, we purposefully didn't collect names so that you could submit your questions anonymously <laughs> without feeling self conscious about it. Just wanted, <laughs> yeah. But you, you, you see a lot of churches. You're, yeah. You're Pastor Isaac. Um, Anything, any observations for us to encourage and, and help us in this area? 
Yeah, I'm trying to, I mean, in some sense, I mean, y'all have been so welcoming and hospitable. It's, it's tough, right? <laughs> like, it's like, these are wonderful people, uh, you know, but, um, so I'm trying to, I'm, I'm genuinely trying to think through, okay, like what areas of growth or here's what, I mean, what I would say is like any conference anywhere, it is just easy to be jazzed about it and then to not be when life starts and it's really hard to keep praying about something and so if there's any area of growth or you know any kind of exhortation i'm like man what is the space where you keep praying about this where you keep this burden in front of the church how does the church do that for itself um, that would be one thing just to keep praying about this stuff that we talked mm. about. Um, and to keep, to keep, to, to, uh, as one person said, to pray and to stay, uh, <laughs> uh, on our knees, uh, before God on this, um, which is an encouragement and yeah. And I think, you know, just maybe in, to in talking to some people, it just seemed like, not that the conversation is, is new, but like it's, it is kind of new for us. I mean, you're a new pastor here, mm -hmm. like, you know, you have your Imago Day series. So just, just, I would think just maybe to put like, um, and wow, I'm going to ask this on camera. Is it James? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I'm just making sure. Uh, uh, you know, James, we were talking about like the, the discount, like the, how this can be uncomfortable. Oh, right. Like, yeah. Oh, I <laughs> said, but like, it's a difficult thing. Yes, I mean, and, yeah. and you address. That's one of the things I really enjoyed about your book is is that you you address the discomfort of of multiple different races, and right. I, and I, right, it was really helpful to see my own story in it, mm. and 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 it made me want to keep reading and keep learning and understanding. Yeah. It was very palatable, and and so, Praise yeah, God. that was. Praise God. So what I would say, I mean, and I've been meditating this on this in my own life is that growth is uncomfortable hmm. and there's really no getting around that. So, and no discipline seems pleasant. Hmm. And God is very kind with some of these sentences he's told us, right? Like very clear, no discipline seems pre pleasant in the present moment, but later on it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness, right? And so just part of so much of the Christian life is bearing it, enduring it. So whatever discomfort there may be, endure it is what I would say. <laughs> I'm going to use that line on my children next time. They start <laughs> <out>. <laughs> I, got, I got a verse for you here, kids. <laughs> yeah. Endure. Here we go. I'm a That's father awesome. who loves you. Yeah. Well, Isaac, in your book, you, you get this really helpful illustration and it's in the section on in your story you've written your fictional story with mm -hmm. the church what is it lincoln lincoln ridge by lincoln ridge. church that's right yeah. so there's there's pastor i had Brood. to look up and be like is that a real church out there <laughs> like not trying to yeah but yeah i don't think there's a lincoln ridge bible out there so well i mean it's, it's a great story and i love honestly was impressed with how well you I only have my my lived experience, but it seems like you know the lived experience of so many different people and how they receive these conversations. Mm -hmm. That was impressive. And the pastoral one, like I read that and I was like, man, this is food for my soul. And you know, your encouragement to the pastor, you talk about the concentric circles. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, could you could you flesh that out a little bit for yeah for yeah. us like here at yeah Bethlehem, the what? kind of like theological triage stuff. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, 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 yeah. So um, I was in the book. We, I was trying to exhort and encourage pastors, church leaders, but Christians at the end of the day, honestly, of, you know, we, there, as we come into this conversation, it's like, there's a question of like, how much should I care about this? Or to put it differently, how big a deal is this, yeah. right? Is this worth leaving my church over? Is yeah. this worth leaving our denomination over? Is this does this mean you're not a Christian if you land X or Y or Z, you know? So to help us through that, you know, there's a practice that, uh, you know, I don't know who t coined the phrase theological triage, but you think of the emergency room or the triage room, it's where they're deciding mm -hmm. like who needs to go back and when they need to go back there based upon, uh, the urgency and seriousness of the injury. It's like, okay, if you have a bro broken finger, you might be able to sit there, but if this person has a bullet wound, we have to tend to them. Uh, and so there's kind of three concentric circles, I think, uh, 
and I'm trying to remember how I laid it out, but basically it's like, hey, is this a, let's put concentric circle one gospel issue. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, And it's basically how, like, it's helpful in determining, like, how much agreement is necessary for functioning. So, uh, for, for, or for even unity. So for, if we're got center circle one is Christian, like Jesus got up from the dead. Repentance is necessary. Uh, and I would say, you know, I would say it's just like racism is sin. Like we agree that like any kind of overt now, Mm -hmm. what we mean by racism, one thing, but Christian circle. Second is church. Okay. So you can have people who are really saved by the blood of Jesus, the kind of church circle, um, people who are really saved by the blood of Jesus, but Hey, I think we should baptize babies and you don't. Right. Or you think we should baptize babies and I don't, I'm a Baptist. I don't think that, but, uh, here we are. Right. And so it's not saying, Hey, you're not a Christian, but it's, Hey, we probably can't do church together. Hmm. Right. Um, so that's why praise God. We have, we have different denominations and we'll sort that out in heaven. <laughs> but I just want to be clear. Circle one and circle two are very different. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we act as if things that are secondary concerns are primary concerns. You're not a Christian. If you think X about whatever we were having lunch earlier about the end times or like, you know, about, uh, you know, yes, we had a conversation about the end times. Thank you. Shy. Uh, you're not a Christian. If you think X or Y or Z, and it's like, all of that is secondary or tertiary. And, and sorry, I feel like I'm mis- missing up the circles because let's just say, I think I had primary is central gospel. Mm-hmm. Secondary is church. Mm-hmm. Third is tertiary. Mm-hmm. When does mm-hmm. Christ come back? Okay. We can right. be in the same church even and yeah. disagree about that. Uh, these are things scripture is not, scripture is clear, but it's not entire. Like it, it does not necessarily bear upon a church's fellowship together. Mm-hmm. And I think part of the real pain we've been feeling over these years is people have different things in those circles. And a lot of people are saying, no, this political thing is a first tier issue for me. Mm. And I think we want to let our tears be driven by the Bible and not by just what we're excited about. Uh, Because otherwise we're going to be in church with people who are just like us. And if everyone at church looks like me, talks like me, thinks like me, votes like me, church might be easy but it wouldn't be glorious because the glory is that God has made enemies and all these different people. He's brought them into one family and they love one another in such a way that the world doesn't. And what actually makes it clear that we do love one another is the fact that we aren't just loving each other because, Hey, we happen to be the same. And really, even if we weren't Christians, we'd be hanging out anyway. It's like, there's really nothing that all that powerful about that. Hmm. Things I missed about theological triage. No, on this that was con- good. on this conversation. Okay. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I think it's helpful, and it's as I was reading it, this wasn't your actual point in it, but it got me thinking about the issue of race, and yeah. um, you know, you said like we'll talk about it as like if racism is sin. There's debates around that, but like labeling it as that. But where where does a care for the, the issue of race and racism fit into the gospel. Because one thing I hear from people often is, and there, you know, there's so many debates going around, yeah. we can't speak into all of it, but um, like the gospel doesn't have a social dimension to it. Mm. Um, and I think I hear what people are saying there, like stop, stop taking something and putting it in the place of like the death and the resurrection of Jesus, you mm. know, his obedience and yeah. his death. Um, but maybe an extreme saying like, well, there's not really a social dimension to it. Let's just keep it like the salvation of souls. But when yeah. I think about the concentric circles and I think about like Galatians 2 that Shai, you both referred to, I think today is mm. Paul, when he sees that ex- ethnic divide between Peter and the Gentiles, he says, you stood condemned, <laughs> Peter. I mean, he says that about Peter. Yeah. Um, You're and, out of step with the gospel. Right. Yeah, so that was, that was new to me. Hmm. I, like I'd, I'd never seen that. And then I was even on my phone, like, is this phrase used anywhere <laughs> else? In any, and right. I, I couldn't find it anywhere. It's just that one issue mm, right. that... Uh, that upon my 30 second search while, while someone was preaching. <laughs> right. um, sorry. Uh, w- I was thought I saw you it. on your phone, James. I was, was, uh, I was, like, I was texting. I have all 11 points written <laughs> down. I was taking mine on my phone too. 
on all right. of them oh, <laughs> and a wow. small text message to Adam. Um, <laughs> but but it was a it was a fascinating point of yeah. you're out of step with the gospel right. yeah. uh, when when you are gosh showing partiality and, yeah. right. and living in this way. Yeah, that was yeah staggering. Amen. And it makes so it makes me think it's like okay. We're not talking about a social gospel. That's what people are often like worried about. Sure. Like you're moving towards something that has been a theology in the past, but like that the gospel does have implications mm-hmm. both vertically with God and horizontally with brothers and sisters in the church and outside the church. Yeah. Yeah. To get Amen. to the, sorry, my long winded question. Like no. what is the relationship in your perspective guys with the gospel of Jesus Christ and like loving brothers and sisters in the world on issues that are social like mm-hmm. race? Great question. You want to start, man? You're flipping through your Bible, so I'm like, I feel like you're like loaded. I up. got a lot of thoughts on this. <laughs> um, Please do share. Mm-hmm. I think Shy did a Shy did a good job giving sort of the biblical overview this morning, but when you look at the storyline of redemption, and you can kind of you can pick a couple different starting points depending on how you want to frame it, but just for the sake of this, start with the Abrahamic covenant, the call of Abram, Genesis 12. I will make you the father of many nations. Eventually we know that's accomplished through Christ. Mm -hmm. Uh, We read in Galatians. Um, But even just that, that call to include an ethnic component in the first sort of pronouncement of the gospel like that is a big deal. And we immediately see from then on in the Bible, God making good on that promise as Thurwin Gray says to the call of Abram is God promising him a multi-ethnic family. Mm -hmm. And that starts happening. And throughout the Old Testament, as the people of God grow, we keep seeing these non-Jews from outside Abram's family, Abraham's family, eventually coming in, whether that's, you know, Moses' Midianite wife or Rahab or Ruth. Um, It starts happening, but then it really picks up steam in the New Testament at, uh, you know, the Great Commission and then Pentecost right afterwards. And Pentecost is sort of this great reversal of Babel where Mm -hmm. the nations are divided. And so if you're looking for it, this multi-ethnic component is all over the story of redemption. And so like to to then bifurcate it and say, well, how how important is this in relation to the gospel? It's all over it. You know, the Mm -hmm. in the Bible you don't get redemption without this multi-ethnic component to it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I I I hear the question, but I don't really understand it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, when I hear yeah, this, yeah. I'm just like, I think I understand where people are coming from, but you're separating something that belonged together. Yeah, and you're not replacing the the death and resurrection of Jesus. You're just extrapolating the benefits of it. Yeah, yeah. And I like. That. I mean, I I just have Ephesians two right in front of me. I mean, one through. Yeah. One through ten, glorious news about God saving us in in two through eleven. The chief fruit of that, he's, he's made one new man. Hmm. And through that one new man, he wants to display his glory, hmm. just as he did in Genesis 1. That man failed. Uh, so the second Adam came, and now we are bound up with Christ hmm. as one new man. And so um, it is it is an interesting thing because, I mean, the, the, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And I think what would maybe give me pause about that question that you just asked is it sounds like you think there was only one great commandment to love God with all Mm. your heart, mind and soul. And it's a very kind of individualistic, like it's me and God, he justified me, me and God was like, but the second greatest commandment of which you, which can't be separated is to love your neighbor. So there is very much a social component to the Christian life. It's Mm. like, and Jesus, by this, the world will know you're my disciples by the way you love one another. Proverbs says, whoever isolates himself. Uh, And so I understand uh, they probably mean something a little bit different by social, like you're bringing in these social justice causes. And to be sure, yeah, the gospel can be displaced and we want to make sure to not do that. Um, But that doesn't mean it's therefore displaced every time we talk about it Mm. by any means. Uh, uh, Maybe to put it a little differently is like you'll hear a phrase like people are like, just preach the gospel. Exactly. Just preach the gospel. Um, And I actually think that's a truncated view of the Great Commission. Uh, I actually think that's not what the Great Commission says. The Great Commission says, go and make disciples of all nation, all nation. All authority has been given to me. Uh, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. So Austin was just getting at that, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, 
and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded. Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes in the Christian life, we act like, okay, Jesus did it all. I don't have to do anything. And of course, on one sense, that's gloriously true. But like I said in the talk, we are not saved by good works, but we are saved for them. And so, and those good works aren't for me. They're for you. Martin Luther said, God doesn't need your good works, but your neighbor does. Right. <laughs> and so like, we want to, we want to, uh, maybe, maybe to answer your question, Adam, like this, my third answer to it. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> 11 points. Right? It was a long <laughs> question. So hey, yo, <laughs> that's right. And I'm going to give you, I'll give you an 11 point <laughs> answer. Uh, it's, I just hope we would be excited about as Christians to be like, man, how can we show the love of Christ to people? How, how can we flesh out the social dynamics of this? Um, because we want the world to see even in the, let's just take it out of social, like outside of our church, but just even in the social community, that is the church. Mm -hmm. How can this place be such a place where the world is compelled to think Jesus is attractive? Mm -hmm. I want what those people have. I want to be loved in, in such a way like those people love one another because that is not what the world has. And I mean, you know, as a pastor, you know, people, um, I think people leave churches all the time for great reasons, good reasons and bad reasons. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when folks leave, not that we're the only show in town, but sometimes, you know, it's, they've got all these things we're looking for. And I'm like, man, I, I, I hope you find what you're looking for. And sometimes folks can leave and they realize, and I think this is a mercy of God that it's pretty cold out there. It's pretty mm -hmm. cold outside the church mm -hmm. and it's pretty warm inside the home, inside the family of God. And so hopefully the dynamics among us socially are such that we are showing the world that there's a kind of love that is wonderful and warm and real. And that's why Paul is so daggone insistent with Peter, an apostle, man, what you are doing, you are, you are denying what Christ bled for hmm. by you pulling back at the lunch table. I mean, it's all very social at the end of the day. This was not, you didn't teach them this in like the synagogue, Peter. It was like, man, y'all was eating fish and pork together. You were, you had no problem with it, Peter, until these guys showed up. And uh, yeah, man, we gotta, we need to be social in that sense, hmm. um, because otherwise we are. I, I Ray Ortland has a book right now called "You're Not Crazy" that just came out with Sam Albury, and they talk about how it's easy to think of. I don't know if they use the word heresy, but you can always think of that as a theological failure. And there is a way to deny the truth of the gospel by how we are with one another, even mm -hmm. if all our doctrine is straight. Paul says, if you don't provide for your family, you're worse than an unbeliever. That's a social thing at the, your family, your unit, mm -hmm. you don't put food on the table willingly, of course, Spare me your systematic theology. Hmm. Well, there's even like a, an implication that ethics aren't part of theology. <laughs> yeah. Like, like feel, yeah. Just as the, that thing, just as we were doing a podcast the other day with someone who was much smarter than Austin and I will ever be. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you just go, like, Oh yeah, we were. Yeah. Like, I was like, our, wait, who? Uh, oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah you're right. Our, <laughs> like one of our favorite theologians, Fred Sanders, we were doing, mm. uh, down at Biola and, um, he was saying stuff. It was, I mean, you ever interact with someone you're like, you've, you, you know more about God than I do. Yeah. And, uh, and, and you've just had interactions with God, thoughts of God. I've never had, mm -hmm. I didn't know you could, that could be had. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, so Fred was talking and, uh, I started, it was just, just worshipful, just mm -hmm. like he was waxing on the Trinity. And it was just like, man. So theology leads to worship. Mm -hmm. Theology also should lead to love of neighbor. It should, it, it, that's, it should manifest that way. We're not cul-de-sacs in which it should come in and stay here. We're pipes. It should come in and go through and Lord willing be expressed as love of, of neighbor. So, and if it does not, it is nothing. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. First Corinthians 13. Paul's like, I could do anything spiritually, hmm. any, he like move mountains, speak in tongues, preach sermons, have conferences, anything spiritually. If I do it without love, it's nothing. Hmm. 
there's nothing new under the sun. And I, I forgive me for pulling my phone out. I was trying to look up this old quote um, from Carl Henry hmm. that I believe he wrote in the forties or fifties. And he said of Christians in his day that Christians in rejecting the social gospel, likewise rejected the Christian social imperative. Ooh. He's like the father of evangelicalism in America, I think, or one of them, right? But what's so depressing is you read that and like, man, 70 years ago and we didn't learn? <laughs> like, mm. <laughs> we need more gears than just, no, not that. You know, there's, mm. there's a time to call out error and there's a time to, you know, to warn, but uh, we're not just the people who don't do things. Mm. Right? Well, that's good. That's good, bro. Yeah. There's so much of... <laughs> I, I mean, and there's so much to wrestle with and, and, and to process through. And, and, and I see, I mean, I, I told you guys, like, a little hesitant to step into this conversation, mm -hmm. but seeing more and more, like, your point of how the issue of race is this Velcro thing, and there's so much attached mm -hmm. to it, um, and how we really live as active members of the kingdom of God and, mm -hmm. and not our own kingdom and not our own comfort and not even the kingdom of America, but but the kingdom of God and, and how this is such a, I mean, Genesis 12, you could probably trace it earlier, but man, I definitely see that theological argument. I love the the point of uh, Pentecost is the reverse Babel and, mm -hmm. and, and how this unity, you know, I've talked with people before who are like, hey, there's one language in heaven, we're all gonna be speaking Hebrew. Unless it's your Greek professor, they say that it's Greek. <laughs> 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 I just, I don't know scripturally how you get there, but well, the, 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 but you see this how yeah. it impacts so much of how we interact and live. Um, Can I offer just a few encouragements to those who might be scared to jump into these conversations? Please, please do. Um, the first one would be like a pretty typical encouragement for me, which is not really an encouragement. <laughs> um, which is just to say that I know a lot of people. Uh, who don't step into these conversations for fear that they're going to do something wrong. And in that sense, it's a good impulse, right? They don't want to hurt someone's feelings. They don't want to say the wrong thing. They don't want to do more damage so they don't do anything. Yeah. And my encouragement is, yeah, you're going to mess up. Hmm. So like, let's just take that if off the table and make it a win. Like if you are engaged in any kind of cross-cultural ministry, but especially this multi-ethnic ministry that's so fraught in our country, mm -hmm. you're, you're going to put your foot in your mouth at some point. And what you actually do when you acknowledge that and you engage anyway, and you give your brother or sister the opportunity to show you grace, you dignify them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you say, I'm, I'm treating you as my equal in Christ, who I'm going to reach out to, not as someone who needs to be like babied and tiptoed around, but as someone I'm required to love, so I'm going to do that in my own messy, clumsy way. Oh, yeah. And I'm going to trust the spirit of God in you to forgive me when I need it. Hmm. Well, that is, sorry, go ahead. No, that's just so good. Um, I, I mean, I relate with that of not wanting to do more damage, mm -hmm. but, but even in abstaining you do damage. Mm. Well, it's like the talents. Yeah. The, the person who buries his talent is called wicked. Right. Mm -hmm. On that, like, can I ask you guys a question? I, I think part of the reticence of folks waiting this conversation is fear of saying the wrong thing, um, offending. Mm -hmm. I, I think from my own experience, one of the things that might keep some people back is the labels that come towards them. Yeah. And yeah. one of the labels that gets thrown around so easily and fast these days is like the word woke. And I'm yeah. sure you guys hear that in your yeah. ministry. Like, do you have any words of encouragement for Christians who are like sincerely love Christ, love the Bible, love people, <laughs> and will most likely when they wade into these things, like their neighbors and their community might label them like that? Like, what would you say to them? What would your encouragement be? So first off, I'll just say that I wrote an article that argued um, basically that Christians should retire that term. Hmm. If we mean it pejoratively, we just, we need to not say that because it doesn't really have a definition. Hmm. And if you're accusing someone of something you can't define hmm. and something they're not able to clear their name of because it's so amorphous, it's by definition, that's slander. Hmm. Um, 
So just as an aside, yeah, if, is that on? Yeah, that's on uh, uepray.org. I could send you the link if you want to put yeah, it in yeah, the show that's... notes. Um, but that's, I just think that's something Christians need to not do. Hmm. Now, on the receiving end, um, I'm sorry. You know, I, I, we've both experienced a fair amount of this. I mean, we've both had, we've both had articles, you know, slanderous articles written about us in various places. I mean, it, hmm. but in a way we've, we've signed up for that in this ministry um, and sort of knew that was coming. But in a way like that, that's something Jesus calls every mm. Christian to, right? We're a servant is not better than their master. Mm. You know, if, if they mistreated him, they're going to mistreat us. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, my, on one level, what I want to say is I have a lot of thoughts on this, uh, <laughs> but uh, on one level, what I want to say is we have got to accept the fact that um, that we will suffer for the sake of the name. That is a part of Christianity. It is a big part of Christianity. Paul is like, I, Philippians 3, I want to know Christ and share in his sufferings. Mm -hmm. Romans 8, uh, he was just like, that I might suffer like and share in suffering as we head to the new creation. Like This is a part of the deal. And on some sense, like uh, I do think the term should re be retired. In some sense, it can be a badge of honor. Like, okay, all right. Mm -hmm. They slandered him. They are going to slander us. Like there is, there are no exceptions. And I know like, I know it is hard to hear that. And I, I was at somewhere recently and a sister, an older sister who was trying to be sweet. She was like, do people call you woke? And I was like, yes but God calls me his son. Mm. And that has got to matter more mm. than what random dude or random or, or my brother or sister in Christ mm. have called me. Like your names don't matter for me. God's name matters for me. Mm. And we just have to get that in our bones. Like proceed in faith, not fear. Yeah. Like, I'm just like, man, the fear of man, you'll never do anything. I mean, like on one level, it almost sounds worldly was you'll never do anything if you're worried about people calling you names. And like, here's the thing. We all, we're all revering, clapping for Martin Luther King. Now his public approval rate was dismal when he lived and praise God, he did the things he did. Right. And so like, it's just like the, like man. And like all of that stuff is going to burn off. It's just mm -hmm. like, yeah, okay, you're calling me a mean name and, it, and it's hurtful, but like I'm here to stand for what's right and for what's true. And praise God, Jesus didn't stop when he was called some bad names. He <laughs> willingly signed up for it. And Paul's talking to, and like just to encourage you as a pastor, like Paul's talking to Timothy and he's actually in every chapter what he talks about is enduring suffering <laughs> and sharing in it. He's like sign up for it. Don't just don't just suffer as it comes, go get in suffering's way. Cause then the gospel can make a way over mm. there. And so I'm not saying go be dumb and, uh, you know, right. get yourself called all sorts of names. Um, but what I'm saying is what I'm saying is, is it's inevitable. Mm. And but the verse I was looking for is just like, uh, the scriptures are talking about like when, when wicked people see your good works, and it implies that your good works will be seen mm -hmm. and you will be reviled for it. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're get, let's just take this out of race for a second. Let's just, okay, take the air out of race. Let's just talk about evangelism. We all agree, right? Good thing, right? Evangelism, mm -hmm. right? Great. Pro-evangelism. Pro-evangelism. Pro, pro telling yes. people about Jesus. And so <laughs> Jesus says, you know, blessed are you when people mock and revile you. Let's say you share the gospel with someone. They're like, you fundamental, whatever you, you bigot, you bigot, right. Mm -hmm. uh, for what you believe. Jesus actually says, do not, do not fear in that day. And actually don't be sad about it. Great is your reward in heaven. Mm. And I think so often we have just such a limited perspective of how I feel in this moment. Oh, my friend, 
social media, what are they going to say? Like, what are people thinking? And like, shame is a really powerful thing. Satan loves twisting and using shame in our souls. But man, uh, we give our shame to Christ. We receive his glory. And then one day in glory, Jesus was, is going to say, well done, my faithful servant. And, the, and he's going to vindicate us in that sense, just as he was vindicated from the tomb. All those names y'all were calling me when I was hanging up there, you're not really who they say you are. Why don't you call Elijah? You could save others. You can't save yourself. I mean, all of that shame. He was like... He was bearing in love. And here's the thing. Here's the real, if we were talking about big kid Christianity now, right? What I would really exhort someone to do who's being called those names, love those people Hmm. and pray for their forgiveness. That's what Jesus was doing on the cross. He wasn't just only silent. He was dying for them. Hmm. And that's where we have the opportunity. Jesus is like, if you love those who love you, what good is that? Right. Even people who don't know me do that. But if you want to be a big kid Christian, you want to be sons of your father in heaven, love your enemies and, uh, back to prayer, pray for them. Hmm. It's amazing. The only other thing he says to do besides love them, pray for them. Hmm. So if you're being called those names, love your enemies and pray for them. And then that is what make, what proves we are sons and daughters of the King of Heaven. Hmm. Sorry for all the sermons today. I haven't preached. No, I mean, we're man, recording this on Saturday. Um, preacher's going to preach. The preacher's going to preach. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I haven't preached yet on Sunday. So anyway. No, we love it, man. Thank you but, for yeah. sharing that. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, and I want to find that verse about the wicked, but yeah, anyway. Earlier we were talking about just like contextualizing the conversation for ourselves, and we were just talking about like what is the Tri-Cities, and yeah. we started talking even just about like what it looks like to be a multi-ethnic church, yeah. and Austin, you were sharing some stuff that you've read on just like the trajectory of multi-ethnic churches in America over the last several decades and like the change in trends. Could you share some of that with us? Sure. Um, This is not original to me and we can link to it uh, again in the notes. Um, Michael Emerson has done some really good and interesting work in uh, exploring the makeup of American churches over time. And he's done a series of major polls and I don't have it in front of me, so I'm not going to get all the dates right. But basically what he's observed is that, um, churches in America have become more ethnically diverse since we were segregated in the sixties. Um, and in a way that is not really happening, uh, anywhere else in society, there's not a good comparison to say, yeah, churches are becoming more diverse just in the same way that something else is, um, something special was happening in American churches, uh, for steadily over years. And unfortunately I say was, Um, because in 2016, that trend started to dip for the first time since they had been tracking it. Um, And Mm -hmm. I believe has been dipping since. So what you have is churches becoming more and more diverse ethnically, and then all of a sudden, not so much anymore. 50 years, essentially, right? 60s to... I mean, I don't know that they had polls at every point going back there, but yeah, I mean, that's starting from zero 50 mm-hmm. years ago to where we were then and are now. Yeah. It was a, it was a steady increase, but then, but just thinking about that, I stated it kind of coldly as a dip in a poll, but think about that. You've got people who perhaps for years have been attending a white church, a majority white church when that's not, you know, their ethnicity and whatever calculus they're running in their head Um, as being like, okay, maybe I have to cross a cultural boundary with worship or preaching or, you know, style or, you know, interpersonal relationships and talking to people who I feel like don't really understand me, but it's worth it. All of a sudden it stops, not, it's, it's not worth it anymore. Mm -hmm. And people are leaving the churches they've been at and going somewhere else. And I, I think about that a lot. Um, you know, you, we could speculate as to why we could point to different causes. Um, but more than, more than any of that, I'm just like, especially in recent years, just really resolved not to be that kind of person who makes church hard for somebody, Hmm. you know, not to be that kind of stumbling block who insists on my own way, my own preference, whether that's, you know, 
yeah, and as much as I can, just, you know, trying to get out of the way. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, just even like the, the reputation of the gospel for, yeah. you're mentioning for all those years, that the gospel is doing something powerful in the body of Christ. And like, how do we, maybe it's not getting back to that, but like, what does it look like for the church? Even just thinking about us contextually here, what does it look like for us as Bethel Church in the Tri-Cities to to make Christ's name great? And, you know, as you were saying, to, you know, be a representation of who Christ is. And he, like, I'm just curious, like for us, James, like your thoughts too, like what, what do you think it looks like at Bethel Church to cultivate the kind of ethos that's like what you're saying, Austin, like getting out of the way, being open to what the Lord wants to do, being a place where... Christ looks compelling to the world around us. What do you think? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a good one. I think I think we've been growing a lot in this. Um, I think we've been growing in this, <laughs> 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 and, and we're a far we're a long way from complete. I, I mean, all of us are a long way from complete. Amen. Amen. But but this overwhelming sense of like of grace and forgiveness and deep understanding mm. of, of what the gospel is and being able to share that with others and, and not simply evangelism. I'm all for evangelism. Um, but e- among our church body of, I- I- is there genuine conversation happening? Um, and then care for when someone has said something you disagree with, mm. you know, I've harped on this a, a, a bit, uh, but how many people know our actual stories? We got to have lunch and someone was spilling their heart oh out over the last four years and the ups and downs and and genuinely sharing the story of God's faithfulness mm-hmm. and not just, yeah, my life has been good the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's got ups and downs like everyone else. I got nothing there. There's no, there, there's no way to really highlight the gospel if life has just been good. You haven't, said anything really about mm, what God's point. grace is. I mean, uh, I think Shai was talking today and, and, and all these different uh, lists of, um, of ethnic sins. Mm. And, and there were some in there that were deeply challenging because it's like, oh man, I've done that. And I think everyone's done that. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's mm-hmm. just, just me, oh, yeah. but I think everyone has done it. Yeah. And going, but if I won't actually confess and talk about that, then I'm not actually telling the story of God's grace in my life. Yeah, that's good. I, I will not admit fault, and, and thus I will not admit grace. Hmm. And, and so to grow in that ability um, and then to be embraced by a community who is caring for you in that, I think is huge. Um, I know in youth we get to talk about that of like who is Jesus, uh, and, and you know gentle and lowly, and says, "Come to me, I'm gonna take your burdens." And um, and how do we live that out with each other? Uh, not just you got to get it right. So mm. I love that. Hmm. Well, bro, like repentance is so countercultural. Oh yeah, and it's terrifying. You got to admit you're wrong. Yeah, that's never fun. And then you got to tell other people you're wrong. You can't just. <laughs> You can't just keep it to yourself. <laughs> yeah, amen. Uh-huh. amen. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up that uh, testimony we heard uh, at lunch because I think what was happening when that person was sharing is they were actually honoring us. They were trusting us in that moment. Yeah, they didn't yeah. even know me, and like they were trusting us with their story. And I felt com- really honored to hear that. And I think if that is happening in the church, just left and right all over mm. the place, like, in other words, we live in a world that is starved for honor, that wants, that craves honor. And it's just like, we, but the world is just like, it's tearing, it's, it's, the world specializes in tearing down mm. sarcasm, slander, gossip magazines. The words I'm saying about people will never build them up. And I mean, when you get, when you receive a genuinely life giving, word that builds you up that honors you there is something otherworldly about Mm. it and to see honor being given and received in the church is a beautiful thing a compelling thing and so i think one way perhaps we want to think about it is just like how can we create 
a culture in which honor is a currency we regularly give, not as a reward, but as a, mm -hmm. I see you and I respect you and I honor you. Mm -hmm. uh, and instead of the like, what we so often resort to, which are the like, the jabs, the kind of mocking jokes, the kind of like, oh, it's all love, you know? And it's like, no, that's not love actually. It's, and so, um, and so I don't think how that relates to your, you know, even the culture for multi-ethnicity is like, okay, even if the demographics don't shift a lot of the times, because I think we can so so often worry about the visible and be like, well, what are our percentages and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, some of that is just out of our hands, yeah. right? Like mm -hmm. we just can't do anything about that, but we can create a culture in which we're honest and that gets to your, you know, repenting and, and and gets to like i love what you said is like if you if you don't admit fault yeah you you might not get whatever called names and you don't have to deal with some hard things but you'll never receive the sweet thing mm -hmm. which is what your conscience longs for the forgiveness and grace of god and so you know even at lunch we were talking you know i had one person share with me about how uh you know kennewick and richland were sundown towns and some people listen. What's a sundown town? Well, no, hold on, because some people listening <laughs> to this might not even know what that is. And right there is an opportunity to dive into something and see that perhaps there's a history here I should learn about, and maybe then might be ashamed about when I learn that a sundown town was a town in which, if the blacks or minorities uh, at the time probably blacks but i don't know the it's i don't both. know the the racial breakdown here um aren't gone by sundown there will be violence mm. and it was like you better be gone by then and there's towns like that in alabama and mm. one person was saying you know we minister in birmingham uh one person was saying you know can it was called the birmingham of the pacific northwest <laughs> Man, I, and so I to be that. honest about that, okay, wah, rah, you guys are getting woke because you're talking about, it's like, we're not trying to, we're not trying to insult anyone. Actually, we're giving ourselves the honor of being like, okay, mm -hmm. let's be real about it because now we can receive real grace on this and be like, because here's the reality. Yeah. Your church is in that kind of city and Jesus loves it anyway. It's right. not like Jesus doesn't know these things about you. So there's no point in pretending that. We should hide these things about mm -hmm. us from each other. Uh, and so it's not just saying to dwell there, but to, to be like, and God's grace is still so mighty. He's like, I'm keeping a witness in that town and I'm still going to raise them up and mm -hmm. I'm not removing any kind of lampstand and I'm going to continue to bless them for my name's sake because God is that good. Right. And so, but we won't taste that. I mean, it's classic James stuff. Like he humble, like... To the humble, he will give the grace. Mm -hmm. But to the proud who don't need it, hey, you don't need it. You don't have any problems. You don't have any history. He's, you're not going to experience a new level of grace that we say we want. Mm. You know, So it's going to come through those messy and hard things of confession, of owning up, of being like, yeah, you thought it was a problem in Birmingham. Birmingham, the problem is Birmingham is in all our hearts. Mm. And it was in this city too. And we, we're not above that. And that's okay because Christ came down for that, to die for that stuff. It's so. like Shai was saying today with justification by faith. Yes. It frees us to name sin where sin is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It frees yes. us as sinners to say, like, so I can good. talk about my sin because as Keller reminds us, like, yeah. like we're worse than we think we are, but we're yeah. more loved than we can ever imagine. Yes. And I was, I was just talking to someone last week. Um, a Hispanic gal grew up in the Tri-Cities um, and she's older than me so she remembers the sundown laws and she was saying that um, she had she had to tell her parents who didn't speak English about that rule about mm. where you could be and where you can be and just like the what that imprinted in her own life and her experience and what she still carries today and hearing her perspective on that of being a person who lives here but even a Christian who lives among a lot of white evangelicals like help me understand her and help me understand a whole space I wasn't even aware of. Mm. Um, and that's just made me wonder, like I would love to have more conversations with people who are not like me to know, like, what is your experience? <laughs> like what, how do you perceive things? Like, what do you hear? Yeah. What do you feel um, with the spirit of what you're saying, Austin of like, how can, how can I, and how, how can we get out of the way in ways that we don't even know we're in the way? Mm -hmm. um, 
but we got to ask questions first. We have to be willing to wade into those. Like, what is, what is the history of this area? What's the history of our own life and the experiences of people around us? But we have to be willing to listen. Yeah. And like Isaac was saying this morning, like one way you can do that is by reading. Yeah. So if you read autobiographies or people who write about, you know, the minority experience in America, you can do that sort of educating work. And I would encourage people to do that before <laughs> they start like peppering their friends with questions, right? Yep. Um, Isaac's written about that mm. and how, you know, we shouldn't primarily treat our minority friends if we're in the majority as an educational resource for mm -hmm. us. But if we can do that kind of that work to educate ourselves beforehand, then all of a sudden we can have a lot better conversations. That's true. You said that this morning. It was after lots of prayer and study and more prayer. More prayer. Then you asked, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it's just interesting. I feel like we keep going back to this lunch, but it was a good lunch, right? <laughs> like uh, a bunch of us are sitting there. And I, I was sitting there being like, you know, if I had, let's say, 45 lives, maybe one of them I would give to writing the history of Kennewick. Like, I mean, the stuff that was coming out, I was like, you have atomic bombs and signs on bridges. Like, I was just like, man, this is an interesting place. Mm -hmm. And it like, it's tempting to think like, oh, you're just flying over that on a map. And it's like, man, there's a history here, just like a history in Birmingham. And it'd be really interesting to learn about and humbling and sobering to be like, man, God is good and patient and kind. And yeah, this is in all our hearts and we want to know history so we don't repeat it. Right. Mm -hmm. And we, and it's really easy to think, oh, well, that's what they did back then. We'll never do that again. And I'm not, I'm not sure why we think that, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, my, the heart is still desperately evil mm -hmm. or desperately sick and still really evil. Who can understand it? Jeremiah asks. And so we need that awareness. We, there's something about that that sobers us to the reality mm. of like, man, like, you know, and like, it's, it goes back to what James was saying. Christ will not be that glorious to you. If you don't think you're that sinful, mm. you know, Spurgeon, he who thinks lightly of sin will think lightly of the savior. Mm-hmm. And he who thinks he's not that liable to fall, the Bible's like, take heed. That's too full. So maybe, you know, in some sense, this conference was a big take heed conference. And it's mm. a good thing to do that. Uh, regard, I mean, James is literally saying, stop laughing, start crying. Mm. Like, right. let your laughter be turned to gloom. And it's like, so anyway, hmm. um, but that just came in. Yeah, it just popped into my mind with like. Man, there's just such a rich history. I've only been here for whatever, 12 <laughs> hours. And I can tell, I'm like, man, there'd be some interesting stories in this town. <laughs> and these three cities, I'm like, right. man, it's like, a, I, I think I was joking at lunch. I was like, this town could have a Netflix documentary about it. Like, But that's true of so many places in America. Right, oh, yeah. right, right. And in that sense, it's not unique. You're right. Well, I mean, so... I moved here from California, and and so my my experience is a, a little bit different. I wasn't born and raised in Tri Cities, and um, and, and so it's easy to not learn the history of the town you're in. Yeah, and then even found myself going like, man, a lot of these issues, they're issues in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. Like they're not yeah. issues here. Yeah, and 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 yet you read a little bit about our city, and you're like, oh, these are big issues that maybe we don't experience them as bad as we did, you know, mm -hmm. 70 years ago, but that, that's just not that long ago. Right. And so there's this still deep history that is there. And, and you look at the way that our cities are split up and there's huge ramifications oh, yeah. from decisions that were made so long ago that it's like, well, it's not like I'm doing this. And, right. and yet it's, it's the culture that we're in. It's the yeah. area, it's the layout, it's everything mm -hmm. that, has attached itself and it's a sticky thing. Right. Um, well, I appreciate what you're saying, James, because I think one thing it does is like when you get to know some of that history though, it does, it does answer some of your questions mm -hmm. when, you know, you, all of us would ask the well-meaning question, like, why is why isn't our church more diverse? Like what are, but then we're like, what are we doing wrong? And it's like, you can feel a lot of unnecessary guilt with that. Of like, well, there's actually a whole story before you got right. here, yep. before yeah. we showed up that we are 
we are a part of. We're not chapter one. We're like chapter 431. So in the first 400 chapters, a lot was going on that we have now inherited. And the question is like, well, what does faithful look, faithfulness look like today right. in light of that chapter? Yeah. Um, you know, I can't hmm. fix it. Uh, you know, one pastor said it's not your fault, but it is your fight. And I think that's, yep. that's a useful kind of breakdown of it. It's not your fault, but it is your fight. So what can we, would that we could undo it all, but right. we can't. So what can we do? You know, yeah. I came across a quote from a rabbi. I cannot remember his name. Starts with a T. I, I quoted a couple weeks ago, but don't be overwhelmed by the world's grief. And he's talking about Micah 6, 8. Mm. Um, but walk humbly now, do justice. Um, your job is not to finish the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. Like, That's good. Yeah. We can't fix it all. And you said that today, right? Like, yeah, you there's a lot okay. of things we're waiting for new creation. We were waiting for God to work, but we are called to labor in it and to work and to pray that the Lord would do a work. And I, I, mean, I would love to see that in the tri cities. And I, mean, I just learned two years ago that you weren't allowed to live in Richland unless you were white in the 1940s. And that's when this whole area was developed. So we talk about like redlining and other places in the South and it's like, well, that didn't happen here. It's like, well, it not the exact same thing, but that's actually our history. Yeah. And it, it makes sense to learn that so we can understand and be empathetic and even understand what it looks like to move forward. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and, and speaking of moving forward, I want to, I want to give this encouragement because, you know, it can't like, it's like any repentance. Like when you're just looking at your sin and you're like, man, this is have this is a lot for me. Right. And it's like, you know, anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word, good word makes him glad. And what we have to love about God is that he loves working. Like you can like, that's the history. Like, man, this is my inheritance, hmm. you know, but God loves working in places, unlikely places. And if there was, you know, in some sense, a kind of, it was a kind of racial graveyard in that sense. Like, it was just like this, there's not a lot of life springing out of like those policies and that history, but that's exactly, God is good at working in the graveyards hmm. and life can come there. And he is not bound by time. A thousand years yeah. are as a night to him. It's just like, mm -hmm. and so, man, he's just like to not give up hope that your story didn't have to be your story for mm -hmm. forever. And actually in Christ, we get a new story. Yeah. I was reading, you know, I was reading Romans the other day about Abraham and it says in Romans four, he did not waver according to the promise. And I was like, hold on a second. <laughs> did we read the same book? Yeah. Like, I was like, Paul, Abraham. The guy was a mess. <laughs> that dude was a mess. He definitely wavered. Mm -hmm. But in Christ, we get a new story. Our mm -hmm. stories are told differently. In Hebrews 11, you have all these people, some of them like, how is that person in the hall of faith? But there they are. And in Christ, we get a new story. Mm. And so it's like, so it's so easy to just focus on the bad of our story, the heart of our story. It's like, man, like God's doing a whole lot. Mm. And like, here we are having this conversation. We've been having this conversation in the 1940s, but here we are. And that, and now that we know that history, it's like, man, we would think it's just another, you know, some dudes getting together, having a conversation. It's like, God's like, that's a miracle mm -hmm. what's happening down there. And it happened in the span of a couple generations and y'all will be dead in a couple more generations, but your kids are going to see that something even more incredible is going to happen in Richland. The question is, do you have faith for that? Mm -hmm. When the son of man comes, will he find faith on the earth? He says at the parable, at the end of the parable of the persistent widow. He's like, the question is not whether I will move. The question is, will you believe? Hmm. That's when, again, to go to big kid Christianity, we start seeing like, okay, but will we pray while we wait upon that? And I think a lot, for a lot of us, the answer is no, because we don't want to wait on the Lord. We're like, I want it and I want it now. This is what James is saying. He's like, you have not because you ask not. Okay, I'm praying about it. You ask for the wrong reason so you can spend it on yourself to go back to our conversation about social dynamics. And he, and God's like, no, 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 no. No, you like pray and wait upon me hmm. and I will act in my time, in my way. 
among my people for my glory. And it's just like, man, like I said earlier, I, I just think it's true. Like we, we have been so discipled by Amazon Prime <laughs> to expect it now. Yeah. I want it now. Yeah, it was rough during COVID when it was like seven day shipping. <laughs> <laughs> man. <laughs> Think about what drawing my subscription there. That was exactly. You think about leaving the club. Well, like, they recommended leaving it outside you know, for you a day. Cats in there, we're like just trying to make do their best. Like all of us, the church, Amazon warehouses, we're all trying to do our best during COVID. And so it's like, it's just like, man, there's some of us, or there's some parts of this, man, where we gotta like, we gotta go back to the basics and be okay with the basics. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna be slandered against if I follow Jesus. I don't care if you're in the race conversation or not. If you're a true disciple, you will be persecuted, mm -hmm. the Bible says. So in some sense, if you're not persecuted, it's like, if your goal is What's to going avoid on? persecution, you're basically guaranteeing unfaithfulness. Right. Like you're mm -hmm. signing up to be unfaithful if you're like, well, I don't wanna be persecuted. It's like, yeah. That's a uh, rough line. Yeah, yeah that's, like, so that's a good line. It's, but but I mean, that's a, it's a it's a hard, slaps. Yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> Watch out over here. <laughs> anyway, yeah. This has been good. This conversation, guys. Um, so thank you. I want to I want to leave just with one question as we're thinking about our discipleship here at Bethel moving forward. You've got a great book. Hopefully people want to read that. We've got resources available. Shai's got a great book. Mm -hmm. Articles on your website. If you were to recommend like one pivotal thing for you, like reading for our own discipleship and growth, what, what would, for each of you, what would that be? If you're to say, hey, go, go read this or go listen to this. Go watch this. What would that be? Sorry, I'm putting you guys on the spot. So. No, I would, I would recommend Francis Schaefer has an essay called No Little People, No Small Places. Huh. And it's a it's it's not about race, but it's about humility. And if every member of this church or my or you know, Iron City Church or any church imbibed what he was saying in that article, hmm. it might just start feeling like revival. I mean, <laughs> it's just like he what he meditates on in that article about about being fully available to God, consecrated to God and let him work in and through you. But it's going to, and, and what he meditates on is like, yeah, just the tendency in all of us to, to want to be the boss, hmm. to want to be in charge, to want our way. I think it's just been one of the, it's just been, it's just been a really helpful read for me. Hmm. And I think it's like, yeah, you can get to all the things we're talking about through that path but it's the lower path and you have to choose mm. to take it. Thank you. We'll put that in the show notes. I've not read that. So thank That's you for really the, good. go check it out. What am I going to say? Yeah, this would be a good uh, exercise. Austin's going to say, he's not going to say a C.S. Lewis book, which he loves, but he quotes that. I'm surprised he didn't quote I thought you were going to quote it earlier. <laughs> he's going to say tired. that he, he tipped his hat to it already. He's going to say the uneasy conscience of, um, no, good guess. Really? Uh, yeah. Who's that by? By Carl Henry. Oh, uh, Carl Henry. What, that's, that's what I that's quoted what from earlier. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, I, I already quoted from it, so yeah. Yeah, partial okay. credit. No, I'm going to recommend um, How to Heal Our Racial Divide by Derwin Gray. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and if you're not a reader, we had him on the podcast, um, and he did an interview about it that's that's basically the bones of the book um, in a podcast form. So if you're, if you're not a reader, but the book itself is incredible because he's able to cover so many different things from – history to theology to even how we talk about these things and the language we use and how does that language compare to the Bible. Um, and it's just, it's a very complete resource to get Christians started. It's written to Christians. It's a Christian book. Mm -hmm. um, but I can't think of another resource that is like, if you care about these things, here's, here's kind of a primer on all of it. Awesome. We'll put in the show notes as well. So thank great. you. Anything you want to say? Last questions? No, James? I've just really enjoyed hearing from you guys and learning from you and um, inspired by your faith and, mm -hmm. and just love of the Lord and love of the church. It's been refreshing to yeah. interact with you both. We've had a great time here. Thank you hey, we'll, for we'll come us. back. <laughs> We'd love to have you back. I'm, I'm, I'm like, I only just want to come and keep poking around <laughs> Tri-Cities. I'm like, man, this is an interesting place. <laughs> But yeah, thanks for coming, and I hope that it's again a catalytic, a catalytic event for our church. Cool. And uh, I'd love to see what the Lord does and the fruit 
over the next few years. So thanks, guys. Thanks for having us. Yeah.